must tell Jesus. Not you, not my mother, not my father, but I myself must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He's kind, compassionate. He's a kind and compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make of my troubles quickly an end. But I must tell Jesus. Our Father and our God, we thank you, Lord God, for this day, for another opportunity yet again to serve. Father, I ask you, Father, to allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be truly accepted in your sight. You my rock, my strength, and my redeemer. And they all said, amen, amen. Greetings to you, my brothers and my sisters. Um, is that rain that I hear? Amen. Amen. Somebody say the devil won't rain on my parade. I know today is Super Bowl Sunday. I know. I know. And we're going to try to get you out here sooner than later. Uh, I would that you pray with me and pray for me and pray that God's spirit rains down upon this place and blesses us with his presence. If you will, go to uh, Romans, we discussed earlier, Romans 13, I'm sorry, 12th chapter. Go back over to the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. And go over to verse number, number one. And we're going to concentrate our efforts on verse one through verse two. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse one through verse two. To give your choir a hand today for a job well done. A job well done. A job well done. I'll be reading again from the New Revised Standard Version. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I have for a text going all in with God, and for a subject, the power to change starts in you. A text going all in with God, and a subject, the power to change starts in you. 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 Didn't say the power to change is in you, but it starts in you. The epistle to the Romans is the sixth book in the New Testament. The authorship of this epistle is accredited to Paul, a servant of the Most High God, who writes this epistle to the church of Rome. There are several reasons that Paul writes this epistle to the church. First, Paul asks the prayers and support from the church to support their journey to Jerusalem. Secondly, from Jerusalem, he is planning to journey to Rome and hopes that the church would support him in his efforts to journey to Spain. Lastly, Paul is made aware of some issues of division between Christians, Jews, and Gentiles that have plagued the church in Rome. The church in Rome was simply divided. And Paul wanted to go to Rome to ask for support from the church so that they could support him in coming to Rome. And he also wanted to go to Rome for support of the church, asking them to help him to get to Spain. But also Paul wrote to allow the church to know, I've heard that there's division in the church among the Jews, those that believe, as well as those that did not, as well as the Gentiles. And I need to dispel some of the stuff going on in the church. The power to change starts in you. The concerns 
are specifically addressed in chapters 13 and 14, yet Paul instructs us in chapter 12 of how we ourselves can go all in for God. We as a church have taken the worldly view of contentment and brought it into the house of God. We bring in the spirit of laziness to our worship services and have become content with the results. We have become so accustomed to partial worship that many of us can't remember how true worship feels or how it looks. We've forgotten so called, uh, we've gotten so caught up in the church service that we've gotten how to prepare ourselves for true worship. We think that we got it, we got it going on just because we have a choir and musicians, a few boards and members of auxiliaries. We've all fooled ourselves into thinking that God would show up for us simply because we showed up for church. Yet this is not the case. If we're going to experience the presence of God, we have to be willing to go all in. God wants to bless us by revealing to us the plans that he has for our lives. The plans that Jeremiah spoke of when he revealed that God's plans for us are plans for our welfare and not of harm to give us a future of hope. In our text, we will see how Paul instructs the members of the church to go all in to prepare themselves to understand the will of God on their lives. Paul reminds the church that, that we, are not, we are not to be conformed to this world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This transformation and this confirmation. To be conformed means to make or become similar. What Paul is saying is we become similar to the world. In other words, he's saying, I can't tell church folk from worldly folk. Y'all ought to hear me in here. I can't tell that, that, that worldly mess from worship, that, you, that, that thing that you call worship in church on Sunday. I can't tell whether or not you're doing a Christian walk or a worldly walk. Y'all don't hear me in here. Some of us in church are doing what I call the moonwalk. Y'all don't hear me in here. Michael Jackson, he, 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 he made the moonwalk famous. And the particulars about the moonwalk is he simply, uh, I'm not going to do it. I promise you I won't. What Michael Jackson simply does is he walks, he walks, or, or he gives you the, 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 the image of walking forward, but he's actually backing up. Y'all don't hear me in here. So some of the Christian folk, is, 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 we give the image of symmetry of walking forward, but we actually backing up in our worship for God. Y'all don't hear me in here. We, 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 we trying to look like we walking forward, but we actually backing up. Y'all don't hear me. We, we trying to look like we praising forward, but we actually backing up. We trying to look like we're worshiping forward, but we actually backing up. We've come content or we've come conformed to this world. But Paul says we ought to be transformed. To transform means to change in nature or function. I, I got to change something about the way I'm doing what I'm doing. I got to change something about the way I'm coming to God's house. I got to change something about the way that I'm thinking about worship. I got to change something about the way I deal with church folk. I got to change something about the way how I interact with worldly folk because I have to be changed from the inside because I have in the inside of me the power to make a change for the best. Paul informs the church that if this process of transformation is to occur, there must be a sacrificial offering of the total body from, belief, from the believer himself. It's further stated to the church that if we're going to understand the will of God or the will that God has on our lives, we must be willing to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. My, my, my. I looked at that scripture and I said to myself, why, 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 that it said that we have to be holy and acceptable because it's holy and acceptable not unto man but unto God. Although this church in Rome was divided, God was still in charge. Paul states that he speaks by the mercies of God. Mercies are merely compassion shown to those believers whom have fallen short in their worship. Paul reminds us that only total worship to God would suffice. God is waiting on our physical offering, not lip service. God's not waiting on us to go through the motions on Sunday morning. God is not waiting on us to pretend that we're in worship on Sunday morning. God is not looking for our best efforts to impress somebody else on Sunday morning. Yet God is looking for our true worship. The Bible says God is spirit and they that worship him must do it in spirit and in truth. And if we're going to have the spirit and truth in the house of God, we have to understand the power to change starts in us. Some of us are hoping that somebody else will get it right and the whole church will catch on fire. 
But if the whole church is wet and asleep, y'all don't hear me, it's hard to put a fire on a wet liquid. Y'all don't hear me in here. The only thing wet that it burned that I ever knew of was gas and diesel. Y'all don't hear me in here. If we offer only a piece of ourselves, that means that we're not fully committed to God. A committed church is a transforming church. A transforming church is a renewed church. A renewed church is a revived church. And a revived church is a connected church. Revival simply means reconnecting to God. But we've gotten out of connection with God because we have been, been transformed, or not transformed, but we have conformed to the world. We become similar in nature to what it is that God preaches on or preaches over. Somehow we've allowed ourselves to go into and have the, the paganistic mindsets that we have on the outside and bring those same mindsets on the inside. It's just some things that shouldn't go on in God's house. Those of you that went with me on last week, I forgot to say thank you. Thank you for your journeys with me. But I'm reminded even in that sermon of how the young folk took the ark of God over in 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter. And when the one young folk took the ark of God, they took the ark of God and they tried to do what they seen somebody else do with God's presence. Y'all don't hear me in here. See, it's some stuff that will work in this church on the corner that may not work in this church over here. Amen. And young folk ought to keep their hands off stuff that they don't know nothing about. And what ended up happening was they took the ark of God and they allowed uh, the young brother in front and the young brother on side of a new cart with new oxen. And the Bible says that the way that the ark should have been moved is on the shoulders of the priest. Y'all ought to hear me in here. But somehow the older folk got, they got lazy. The daddy says, I want the two sons, I want my two babes to go and move the ark because I bet y'all can do it better than I can because I'm now old in age. And what the church found out is when you bring too much of that worldly stuff over into the church, the church begins to stumble. Y'all don't hear me in here. It says that when they got to Nacon's threshing floor that there was a stumble. And because of the stumble, one of the young folk put his hands on the ark and he instantly died. Y'all don't hear me in here. It says worship service just stopped. But it says now what happens with the leadership is the leadership got discouraged and left the Ark of the Covenant over at Obed-Edom's house. Mm. I went back. I went back, Brother Emerson, and I, and I looked at Obed-Edom again. And Obed-Edom is amazing. Obed, E-B-E-D, means worshiper. My Lord. And Edom means the house of Edom. So what they did was they took the ark from out of the hands of the church that brought the world into the church and put it in the hands of a worshiper. Oh, somebody missed me there. And when they put it in the hands of a true worshiper, what ended up happening is as the worshiper began to change or knew that he had the power to change the surroundings of the ark of God, the worshiper began to worship in his house and everybody in the whole neighborhood got blessed. Oh, somebody didn't hear that in here. That one worshiper took the same Ark of the Covenant that the young folk had put their hands on that didn't know what they were doing with it and put it in the hands of the worshiper. And the worshiper did that and what God had trained him to do and begin to worship God. And when he began to worship God, blessings went all over the city. Then the church found out. And the church went back and got the Ark. And the church then realized that they had the power on the inside to change the church. They realized that they didn't have the power to take the ark and worship God for real. It says the next time that they took the ark, they simply took six, space, six paces and they stopped and they began to give God some sacrificial worship. Y'all don't hear me in here. 
it says they began to give a burnt offering and sacrifice some of the animals there. And they kept on in this process until something happened in the church that was miraculous. It says that the head brother in charge began to shout and began to give out a, a holy dance. Y'all don't hear me in here. Somehow the spirit of worship hit the whole church. And when they came into town and began to bring the Ark of the Covenant over in the temple, they couldn't get in fast enough because they were shouting on the outside before they came into the temple of God. You ought to know that you have the power on the inside to change what's going on in the church. But you need to understand that if I got the power, I've got to activate the power. I can't sit down on what God has instilled on me. Because if I sit down on it, then somehow worship won't be the way it ought to be on Sunday morning. Somehow the spirit of God won't come into the church and bless everybody in the church. Somehow I won't get the things that I ask God for. Because the Bible says that God is truly spirit and if you're going to worship that spirit you got to do it in spirit and, and truth I don't know about you but there's some truth on the inside that wants to get on the outside so that I can bring God on the inside of the church so that when God gets here God begins to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on everybody that's over in the church but I got to understand it starts with me don't start with you it don't start with the choir it don't start with the musicians but it starts with you it starts with how you come into the church on Sunday morning it starts with how you prepare yourself on Saturday night so when I get here in church God will show up because I got God on the inside of me and when God shows up God has a way of showing out but I do declare when God shows up in church on Sunday morning if you have God on the inside things won't be the same Things won't be the same. The power to change starts in you. Look at this. Look at this. God is looking for an even exchange from the church. Nothing more or nothing less than our reasonable sacrifice. So what part can I play in this transformational process? Look at what Paul says. Verse number one, he says, I appeal to you, therefore. Therefore means for that reason. So I had to go back in chapter 11 and understand what reason Paul was talking about. See, the church felt that God had turned his back on them. The church felt that somehow God was punishing them for something that they had done. The church felt that somehow God had a respect of persons. But Paul dispels the rumor and tells him that God has given you mercy even though you ain't done the right thing by God. Paul says even though you come, even though you come and, and you have a difference of opinion, the church is divided, but God still gave you mercy. Even though you didn't pray like you ought to pray, God still gave you mercy. Even though you're talking about one another and scandalizing each other's name, God still gave you mercy. But the thing that God is waiting on from you, God is waiting on your total sacrifice. I'm reminded that I'm so glad that Jesus didn't give a partial sin offering. Because hmm. Jesus didn't do anything, but, but Jesus died for my sins. But he didn't partially die. Oh, somebody ought to help me in here. The soldiers made sure that we knew that he died for real. Because it says they pierced him with his side. And they said what came down was blood and water. Mm. Mm. And it says to be sure and very sure that he died, that they put him over in a borrowed tomb. And they sealed the borrowed tomb. And it said to be sure without a shadow of a doubt that he died, he was in there for three days. Y'all right. don't hear me. You can't go three days without moving. Oh, help me somebody. And to be sure and very sure that Jesus got up on the third day, they rolled the stone away. And Jesus sat on the stone and waited on a witness. Y'all don't hear me in here. 
And it says that when they were in the church with the doors locked trying to have worship, Jesus just walks through the door. Y'all don't hear me in here. And when he walked in the door, he came and brought blessings to everybody. In the, he said, peace be unto this place. Because they had in the inside the power to change. So how do we do this? 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 Watch this. Watch this. The first thing that we must do, write this down. We must make an offering unto God. We must make an offering unto God. Don't shake your pockets. Don't check your purses. You don't even have to balance your checkbook. In, in fact, you don't even pick up your pen to make this offering. Oh, help me somebody. This is one of those offerings that, that either you got it or you ain't. Either you're willing or you're not. Paul says, Paul says, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present. To present means to offer. I want to offer up to God. He says, what you need to offer to God, he says, watch this, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I need you to offer your bodies unto God. I need you now to make an offering. And when you make this offering, I need you to prepare before you even get here that you're going to offer yourself up to God. I got to already make up in my mind that, that I'm going to offer myself today up into God. I, I'm going to do it, brother. The person sitting next to me is going to do it themselves. I'm going to do it because I want to offer myself totally up to God. Because if I offer myself totally up to God, that means I'm committed to the work. Y'all don't hear me in here. And if you're really going to fully offer yourself up to God, that means you have to start before you get here getting your mind ready for the offering. Y'all don't hear me in here. You remember the brother that went to the mountaintop to sacrifice his son. They traveled all day long and they had an entourage with them. And when they got to the bottom of the mountain, he told the entourage, stay right here while me and the boy go yonder and we'll be back. And when he got to the mountaintop, the little boy says, well, where is the offering? He had to prepare in his mind before he even left the house that he was going to offer something special unto the Lord. But the Bible says that when he began to worship God, y'all don't hear me in here. It simply says that when he raised his hand to slew the boy. See, the raising of the hand is a part of worship. He said as soon as he began to worship the Lord, that's when he found a ram over in. Y'all don't hear me in here. It's something about your worship that brings God to the attention of your position and your situation. And God begins to send out blessings when you didn't even ask for them. But you got the power or the power to change starts in you. God wants all of you, the total of you, not just a piece of you. God didn't pay a partial ransom for our sins. He paid it all. God is not looking for a partial offering from us uh, as Christians, but God wants it all. Through our partial offering, we see a partial return. Jesus said, I wish you were either hot or cold, but you lukewarm. That means you partially hot and partially cold. And I don't know what to do with you. See, if you're all the way cold, I know, I, I know how to thaw you out. I shoot that spirit that gets shut up in your bone that feels like fire that you just can't leave alone. If you get too cold, I can do that. Y'all don't hear me in here. But if you get hot and you get thirsty, I got something that can quench your thirst. But you lukewarm in the middle and I don't know what to do with you. Help me somebody. If we only offer God a piece of us, that means, that means that we're not fully committed to God. If we're committed to God, it's only then when God will give us a return for our commitment. God says, I want all or nothing. Not only should we make an offering, but the second thing that we should, that we should do is take control of the way that we think. 
Oh, in verse 2, Paul says, do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Paul says, I need you to change the way you think. If you're going to offer yourself up to God, I need you to change the way you think about it. Because when you offer yourself up to God, nobody knows that you've made that offering but you and God. But now you got to change the way you think because the way you think controls what you do. Y'all don't believe me, do you? The Bible says the soul is willing, but the flesh. Mm. And the mind has control over the body. And if you change the way you think about worship, the way you think about offering yourself up to God, then when you will begin to renew your mind. To renew your mind is to make it new all over again. It wasn't until we got into the world that we began to think foolishly. Sister Lana took Junior to Barnes and Nobles yesterday. And there were some kids playing in the little kitty playground area. And she told me that Junior went up to this, this brother that was of a, another distinction. And this brother was taller than Junior older in age and his brother had a train that Junior wanted and she said Junior went up to the brother and stared him down <laughs> and the brother wouldn't move so Junior grabbed the train and walked off with the train to begin to play and said the brother's mother looked at Alana and she says she was so shocked she says well they got to figure out their own mess but what got me was my son was playing with someone he's never met before. Y'all don't hear me in here. Didn't matter how tall he was. Didn't matter what color he was. Didn't matter what race he was. Did not matter that he was older than. It was just the fact that you got something I need, something I want, and we're going to play for a minute. His mind was not polluted yet with stuff of the world. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? In other words, we're not born with some of this foolishness that we bring from the outside of the world. We're not born with it. We taught it down through the years. My drum major in high school, my sophomore year, I'm sorry, my junior year in high school, I thought he was the coolest brother on the planet. Uh, we rode around. He, he has a General Lee truck. He has a truck that's painted orange with the, with, the, with the tin on the side of it with the rebel flag on the top, and he'd bring that to band practice, and, and I would always ride home with him because he was the only one that would let me ride with him without paying gas money. And uh, every time we'd go home, we'd always go down the river and through the woods. We would never just go hit the highway and get to the house. We can get there in 15 minutes, but it took him 35, and I was always wondering, you know, why you always want to take the scenic route. But I figured since he had a car, he wanted to, to show me that he could drive and drive fast. And one day, one day, one day, that was a problem. That was a problem. That was a serious problem. We needed to go by a certain store to pick up his sister. Mm. And, and, and this brother, I did say he was a brother, didn't I? But I didn't say he was from another mother. I didn't tell you that, did I? He was actually from a cousin. Y'all don't hear me in here. And, 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 and we got to the store, and he says, get in the back. Well, well, I've always seen you, your sister, and your cousin sit in the front, and your sister always sat in the middle. Now, why can't she sit in the middle of the day? And he says, my grandfather owns the uh, gas station. I said, that's cool. That's cool with me. Maybe he'll give me a job. You don't understand. You don't understand. My grandfather is the grand wizard. Uh, cool. My dad, my dad a DJ. You know, I didn't, I didn't understand all of that talk. A am I making any sense? Didn't understand all of that kind of talk. But when, when he began to explain it to me, now I've, 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 what has been birthed in me is hatred and anger. I can't bring that into God's house. Y'all don't hear me in here. Because Jesus says if they hit you on the 
turn the other. And I always thought that if I could just take two licks, Jesus got everything else. Because they ain't got but two chins. Y'all don't hear me in here. So the thing that we have to do is change the way we think. So how can we apply that to church? If I don't like what the choir is singing, I need to change the way I'm thinking about it. Because there's a message in the word. Y'all don't hear me. If I don't like what the preacher is preaching, I need to change the way I think. Because God may just tell me something even in announcements. But I won't hear it if I don't change my way of thinking. I may not like children's church. But you never know when God's going to show up and give you a message for your situation. I got to change the way I think. I may not like giving unto God because I know that preacher going to buy him a brand new car with my money. I got to change the way I think. Because if I think the brother going to take my money, the brother going to take that and even some more. But I got to change the way I think and how I approach God on Sunday morning. That brother, I never rode in his car again, his truck again. But a few years after I graduated from, from, from high school, I met up with the brother, and, and he, he, he was crying. And I said, what's wrong, man, my friend, you know? And he said, I'm upset. I'm no longer a drum major. I said, what happened? Uh, his grandfather had influence on what the band would play. And uh, what his grandfather failed to realize was that uh, God had his hands on the school and the band. And after he began to talk so much about what he wanted to see changed, that, that he was no longer able to be drum major. The sad occasion was my brother, who was the shortest person in school, ended up being drum major. Y'all don't hear me in here. You see how what was on the bottom came to the top? I couldn't even ride in the front seat of your car. Now you asking me to tell my brother he don't want to be drum major? <laughs> Uh, Y'all don't hear me here. You never know when you change your way of thinking how God can bless you and bless those around you. Watch this. The soul is willing, but the flesh is weak. The soul wants to be in, in the place of peace and love with our neighbors, but the flesh is weak. The soul wants to give honor and adoration to God, but the flesh is weak. The soul wants to be nearer to God, but the flesh is weak. When we take control of our thinking, we take control of our flesh. When we take control of our actions, when we take control of our motives, when we take control of our motivations, we, we take control of our doing, that's when we take control of our thinking. If you think that you have failed, don't even try. If you think that you can't make it, don't even try. If you think you can't sing it, don't even try. If you think you can't do it, don't even try. But when you, when you begin to put in your mind that I can do anything but fail through Christ Jesus that strengthens me, then you can go into any situation holding your head up high, knowing that God's going to show up in just a minute. He may not show up when I want him, but I declare he's always on time. Last point, and I'm going to get out of your way. Last point. Remember that we need each other to make it work. Remember that we need each other to make it work. We need each other to make it work. My Lord, that's a powerful thought. I've offered everything that I have of value to me, which is my life to Christ. Then I changed the way I'm thinking about worship. And now I have to depend on somebody else to help worship come to fruition. I got to realize that I've got to trust you now and trust that the God that dwells in you is the same one that dwells in me. And I've got to trust that when we come together touching in the green, that Jesus will be in the midst. I got to trust that you're worshiping the same God that I'm worshiping. Y'all don't hear me in here. Because even now, somebody's worshiping the Super Bowl and they ain't even started yet. Y'all laughing, so I guess I'm telling the truth. Somebody already thinking about the chicken and the chips and dip. 
and their favorite team and their favorite jersey. Somebody already thinking about it. But what if we were thinking about Jesus in the Super Bowl of life? What, what, what if, now watch this. The Super Bowl is only one game. And you got one shot to make the right plays. Because we can't play this game over next week. Y- y'all don't hear me in here. Life is like a Super Bowl. The plays you make are just the plays you make. There's no instant replay. There was only one brother in the Bible that had an instant replay. And that was Hezekiah. He says that when he was sick and in the fourth quarter, he laid down on the bench. Like some old folks say, he laid down on the bench. And he prayed to God to extend the quarter. And God allowed him to go into overtime. Y'all don't hear me in here. And in overtime, he was able to win the game. But we all don't have an overtime. All we got is right now. And right now ain't even guaranteed. Because the Bible says don't put off tomorrow what you can do today because tomorrow is not promised to you. So while we're in here, we need to think on the, the fact that somehow, some way, we only got one shot at this thing. And if I got to depend on you to get Jesus in the house, then let's hook up and make it happen. But when we begin to divide ourselves even in worship, that's when we divide ourselves even in blessings. Because the blessings that you got, you're able to, God blesses you so that you can bless somebody else. I don't know about you, but he that gives to the Lord lenders unto the, or lenders to the Lord then lenders unto the poor. So with that being said, I want to give something to the poor so God can give right back unto me. But somehow, some way, we need to understand that we need to get aside or put aside our differences. If I got a difference with you, I need to put it aside because I need you to make this thing happen. I need the choir to be singing. I need the ushers to be on the door. I need the musicians to be playing. I need the preacher to be preaching. I need to set aside those heavy weights. When I can set aside those things, that's when I'm able to understand that I need you. And you will understand that you need me. And then it doesn't matter where we are or when we are, we're okay with calling one another. <laughs> calling one another and having worship even when we're not at church. We'll have a problem calling one another even when we're on our jobs. Have you ever seen somebody on the job and they treated you funny on the job? But then wanted to embrace you when we got to church with your fake and phony self. power to make a change is in you. As I close, I'm reminded of how Jesus allowed the disciples to be utilized to make a change. After Jesus had died and he rose up on the third day with all power, the church was divided. Peter had stashed a boat somewhere and said, y'all, I'm going fishing. And half of the church went with Peter on his fishing excursion. And what they did was they were casting their net on the left side of the boat. And they caught nothing all night long. But then the power to change was in the crew. Because they saw a man on the shore that asked one question to the church. What have you caught? They responded, we have caught nothing. And the man on the other side says, you have the power to change your circumstances. Cast your net on the right side of the ship. And the story says that after they cast the net on the right side of the ship, the fish just jumped into the net. And when the ship, the, the, the fish jumped into the net, the brother was so excited that Jesus made a change in the church that he jumped out of the boat with nothing on. And he swam to where Jesus was. He simply sacrificed his whole life. Went into the water, bare naked, to get to Jesus. And when he got to Jesus, he was able to put his head on Jesus' shoulder. And Jesus asked him a question. Do you love me? (laughs) Feed my sheep. 